أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد من كلام لإمامنا وسيدنا علي بن أبي طالب عليه السلام قال والله, والله ما زلت مدفوعا عن حقي مستأثرا علي منذ أن قبض رسول الله My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته In continuation with the subject of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam where these nights coincide with the anniversary of his martyrdom we will be talking tonight about the plight and the ordeals of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam Imam Ali alayhi salam was a spectacular and outstanding ruler in the Islamic history that his words and positions are very worthy of reflection and ponder because we can see that the scenes that Islamic nations and Islamic communities are undergoing right now is, are remarkably similar to the scenes in 1400 years ago. The same scenes that the Imam alayhi salam undergone. Those are also repeating themselves at current time. Therefore, if we go to the past and make them as our lessons so we can avoid the trouble and the mishap for our future. This is one reason we will be discussing the plight of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. And the other one is to look at this unique personality, this unique leader. Probably Ali ibn Abi Talib is the only governor, the only ruler who was complaining, bewailing his servants, his subordinate, subordinates, and his citizen. Throughout history, it is always the people, the citizens, and the subordinates of the ruler who complain and have grievances against the ruthlessness and the oppression of their rulers. But in the case of Ali ibn Abi Talib, it is just the opposite. It is him who were complaining and showing his grievances against his own subordinates for variety of reasons that we will be talking about. Tonight, we will shed some light on the history's injustice, the life's injustice toward Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. The problems and ordeals of Ali ibn Abi Talib started from the moment that the Prophet, peace be upon him, passed away. First, Ali ibn Abi Talib lost his cousin, his mentor, and his teacher. Later on, the Khilafah was confiscated from him. He was sidelined to, due to a coup against him. Third, the property of his wife has been plundered and ransacked and taken away. Fourth, the events that led up to the miscarriage and murder of the fetus, Al-Muhsin. Unfortunately, one third of the Prophet's progeny were destroyed. The Prophet, peace be upon him, had two grandsons and all children of the Prophet had to be connected to those two sons, Hassan and Hussein. If, if Al-Muhsin were alive, then the children of the prophets, the progeny of the prophet, have been increased by one-third. So the imam and the prophet, after all, were deprived from this fetus. And finally, the martyrdom of his young and beloved wife. From the very beginning, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib faced injustice and oppression. 
30 years later, the Imam alayhi salam says, Wallahi ma ziltu madfu'an an haqqi, musta'atharan alayya mundi an qubudha Rasulullah. When he was a governor, he would say that people has deprived him from his legitimate rights. Now, when he became a ruler, by consensus, by election, the Islamic Ummah overwhelmingly supported his leadership and pledged allegiance to him. Right after three groups in the Islamic community, they renegated and they turned against Ali ibn Abi Talib. The harshest among them was the war with Muawiyah. Muawiyah orchestrated a very bloody war against Ali ibn Abi Talib. In the Battle of Siqfin, more than 45,000 from soldiers of Muawiyah were killed, while Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, lost 25,000 soldiers. The results and consequences were very disastrous to the Islamic nation. Despite so many, in addition to so many heavy losses, there was a formation of the renegades called Khawarij. Due to the arbitration, the Khawarij came against Ali ibn Abi Talib and Muawiyah. But Muawiyah exerted the heaviest damage to the Islamic nation and to the rule of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He orchestrated two kinds of battle, the psychological war as well as the physical war. The psychological war was the propaganda machine that Muawiyah used to play and masterfully do against Ali ibn Abi Talib to discredit him, harboring and bankrolling a bunch of the so-called companions of the Prophet who were weak in spirit and in determination. They had been used to say words, negative words against Ahlul Bayt and Ali ibn Abi Talib in particular. The physical war also had multiple forms. One was attacking and annexing territory from the Islamic empire, the one that was under the rule of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Muawiyah would attack different sides and different locations of the Islamic empire and annex them and chop them off to his own rule such as Yemen, for example. Another form of the battle that Muawiyah used to do and implement was the war of attrition. It is the hit and run style. This was meant to exhaust the army of Ali ibn Abi Talib. They would attack the province of Anbar in Iraq. They would kill the governor they would ransack and plunder people's wealth. Here the Imam alayhi salam put it elegantly. He says, وَلَقَدْ بَلَغَنِي أَنَّ الرَّجُلَ مِنْهُمْ كَانَ يَدْخُلُ عَلَى الْمَرْأَةِ الْمُسْلِمَةِ وَالْأُخْرَ الْمُعَاهَدَةِ فَيَنْتَزِعُ حِجْلَهَا وَقُلْبَهَا وَقَلَائِدَهَا وَرُعَاثَهَا مَا تَمْتَنِعُ مِنْهُ إِلَّا بِالْإِسْتِرْجَاعِ وَالْإِسْتِرْحَامِ ثُمَّ انصرفوا وافرين. He would say that the army of Muawiyah would attack the city, the civilians. He would kill the soldiers. Then he will attack the weakest of all the ladies, the women. He has attacked the Muslims and non-Muslims, the Christians or Jews in Anbar. Then they would have plundered, they have plundered all their belongings, the jewelry, the necklaces, the bracelets, the earrings. And he said that the woman had no means of defense except for begging those soldiers and asking them to leave them and abandon them and leave them alive. Then the Imam says, if someone dies 
from anguish and anger, it wouldn't be surprising to me. In fact, this is very befitting. Look at the spirit of Ali ibn Abi Talib. When an army or an enemy attacks only the women who happen to be non-Muslim, but they were living under his territory and his authority, the Imam would feel so sorry that he could not defend them. That was the plight of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now, how could Muawiyah do all of this? What kind of magic work he used to do? Ali ibn Abi Talib has put all of those in one beautiful sentence. He says, فَوَاعَجَبًا وَاللَّهِ يُمِيتُ الْقَلْبِ وَيَجْلِبُ الْهَمْ مِنْ اجْتِمَاعِ هَاؤُلَاءِ الْقَوْمِ عَلَى بَاطِلِهِمْ وَتَفَرُّقُكُمْ عَنْ حَقِّكُمْ The Imam elegantly put it in one word, that the followers of Muawiyah, the army of Muawiyah were united, despite the fact they were on the wrong track. On the wrong track, they were on the false track, while the followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib were on the right track, but they were disunited. They, they have lost their morale. They became feckless. They lost the spirit to fight. The Imam says that this is, has becoming the consequences. That was a reality on the ground. That the followers and army of Muawiyah were very united following a single leadership while the followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib were not so. So the human, the overflow, the overflow of the human quantity does not play any role if they do not have unity. If there is no unity among them, then they become feckless. Look at history. 1,313 people in the Battle of Badr, they have changed the course of history. Why? Because they were all united under the leadership of their prophet, their leader. While today, there are 1.5 billion Muslims, but they have lost their political will and their luster and influence. Why? Because they are all disunited. They don't have unity among themselves. Ali ibn Abi Talib alludes to this fact. Ali ibn Abi Talib repeatedly admonished his followers to fight against Muawiyah, to stay steadfast and continue resistance. In many narrations, in many sermons, he would encourage them to do more of a struggle. In one beautiful sermon, he discusses the beauty of a struggle or jihad. He says, أَمَّا بَعْدْ فَإِنَّ الْجِهَادَ بَابٌ مِنْ أَبْوَابِ الْجَنَّةِ one gate of heaven is called jihad against those tyrants and oppressors, but to no avail. People were not listening to him. Multiple times he would ask them to reciprocate the attack that Muawiyah would carry out against the communities in Iraq and different parts of the Islamic empire, but to no avail. They were not ready to fight. Many times he would say, I would have wished that Muawiyah have exchanged you with his followers. He would give me one of his soldiers and would take 10, ten of you that much you were so feckless and lost in morale. The Imam continued to admonish them, but at no avail, until he reached the point of despair. Many times he would say, The Imam would say, I wish I wouldn't have known you. I wouldn't have come to you to be your ruler and your leader. And in many occasions, 
he would say, مَا يَنْتَظِرُ أَشْقَاهَا لِيُخَضِّبَ هَذِهِ مِنْ هَذِهِ Where is this man waiting to come and soak my beard with the blood of my head? The Imam have spent most difficult period of his life in the last years of his life. On the moment when he collapsed in the mihrab, in the house of worship, he said this beautiful word, Fustu wa Rabbil Ka'bah. I got relieved from my agony, from my plight and my ordeal. Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam lived but not among his people. He lived in a wrong time, in a wrong place, with wrong people. We will come. يا من نفذ في كل شيء أمر يا من لحق بكل شيء علم يا من بلغت إلى كل شيء قدرة يا من لا تحصي العباد نعما يا من لا تبلغ الخلائق شكرا يا من لا تدرك الأفهام جلالا يا من لا تنال الأوهام كنها يا من العظمة والكبرياء رداء يا من لا ترد العباد قضاء يا من لا ملك إلا ملك يا من لا عطاء إلا عطاء سبحانك يا لا إله إلا أنت الغوث الغوث خلصنا من النار يا رب يا من له المثل الأعلى يا من له الصفات العليا يا من له الآخرة والأولى يا من له الجنة المأوى يا من له الآيات الكبرى يا من له الأسماء الحسنى يا من له الحكم والقضاء يا من له الهواء والفضاء يا من له العرش والثراء يا من له السماوات العلا سبحانك يا لا إله إلا أنت الغوث الغوث خلصنا من النار يا رب اللهم إني أسألك باسمك يا عفو يا عفو يا صبور يا شكور يا رؤوف يا عطوف يا مسؤول يا ودود يا سبوح يا قدوس سبحانك يا لا إله إلا أنت الغوث الغوث خلصنا من النار يا رب and elegant Dua Joshan Al-Kabir. We are in segment number 55, 56, and 57. 
The segment number five, the theme of it is to cure diseases. And it goes, Ya man nafada fi kulli shay'in amruh. Ya man lahaqa bi kulli shay'in ilmuh. Ya man balagat ila kulli shay'in kulli shay'in qudratuh. Ya man la tuhsil ibadu ni'amah. Ya man la tablughu al-khala'iq shukrah. Ya man la tudriku al-afhamu jalalah. Ya man la tunalu al-awhamu kunha. يا من العظمة والكبرياء رداؤه يا من لا ترد العباد قضاؤه يا من لا ملك إلا ملكه يا من لا عطاء إلا عطاؤه where the translation is he for whom he whose commands operates in everything he whose knowledge encompasses everything he whose control extends to everything he whose bounties cannot be counted by his servants. He whom his creatures cannot adequately thank. He whose grandeur cannot be comprehended by the intellect. He whose reality cannot be acquired by the imagination. He whose grab in majesty and greatness. He whose judgment cannot be reversed by his slave. He whose alone is the kingdom and no one else, whose alone is the gift and no one else. The words of choice for this segment is Ya man la al khala'iqu shukra. Those that his creatures cannot reach the level that deserve to be praised and thanked. The Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us so much of blessings and mercies and benevolences that in no way we can reach thanking them or reciprocate him with thanking him and appraising and appraising him. From the simple breathing, this inhale and exhale of oxygen that we do, to the time of a sleeping, to the muscles that we use in our jaws when we eat or when we smile or we even talk, to the movement that we do, all of those involve so many blessings of God that we cannot reciprocate the favor by any means. Although we are ordered to be thankful, thank the Almighty and praise Him for all those good things, yet there are only very few people who do that. As the Almighty says, وَقَلِيلٌ مِنْ عِبَادِيَ الشَّكُورِ Only very few number of people who praise the Almighty for the mercies, for the bounties that He grant us. Grant us. The purpose of appraising and a placing, a placing thank for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he would continue with his blessings, with his mercy toward us. As the ayah says, <clears throat> لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ وَلَإِن كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيدٌ The more you place thanks and praise, the more replenished you will get the more of those bounties will be replenished to you and will be given to you. We will receive ample of these bounties. The word shukr means praise or placing thanks. And it can have multiple forms. One, I can do it through my tongue. Verbally, when I say alhamdulillah, I place thanks and words of praise using the verbal mode. Or the ayah says, وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ Speak about the blessings, the mercies, and the bounties that God has given you with the intention to say that it is the grace and wisdom and benevolence of God that He has given me so much bounties. This is one way. Obviously, Many people do that, but sometimes they do it unconsciously or subconsciously.
they're not even thinking of what they are saying. So the higher level of thanking is when we thank the Almighty through our actions. It is remembered, it is the actions and the deeds that speak louder than words. Through my attitude, through my behavior and my action I place thanks to the Almighty. As he says, He says that, O oh, Ala Dawood, the progeny of Dawood, do with your actions a place thanks and a praise to me. And that is very important, brothers and sisters, is that my actions speak for themselves and reciprocate the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I am educated and knowledgeable, then my thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting me so much knowledge is that I disperse it to others. First, I act upon my knowledge, I implement the knowledge that I have received, and second, I spread it to others. As Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam says, شكر العالم على علمه عمله به وبذله لمستحقيه When he acts upon his knowledge, whatever he learns, he should implement that on himself. That should be reflected on his actions, on his deeds and demeanor. And second, he should teach it to others. Or if I am wealthy, God has granted me so much wealth, my duty is that I give some back to the public, give some back to the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because God has entrusted me with that amount of wealth. This wealth does not belong all to myself. It is with God's grace and wisdom has been granted to me. Therefore, I have to take a tiny portion of it and give it back to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These actions are considered to be shukr and hamd and praising the Lord. And the higher of those is the conscientious thought, think, thanking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that the bottom of my heart, I know the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I know and I am certain that I cannot reciprocate, that it is beyond my ability and capacity to reciprocate the favor the favor of God when I have a conscientious feeling about this for this point this is the ultimate of praise and the ultimate thanking of the Almighty Al Imam Hussein alayhi salam has a beautiful and eloquent words in dua Arafah he says that وَلَوْ حَاوَلْتُ وَاجْتَهَدْتُ مَدَى الْأَعْصَارِ وَالْأَحْقَابِ لَوْ عُمِّرْتُهَا أَنْ أُؤَدِّيَ شُكْرَ وَاحِدَةٍ مِنْ أَنْعُمِكَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُ ذلك. If I spend my entire life in addition to the millennia, to the centuries, if you God grant me so much life and I end up only praising you for a single blessing that you have given me, I would not be able to. Therefore, it is incumbent that I would place thank. But this thank is to whom? The benefit is not to God, rather it is to me. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ شَكَرَ فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرُ لِنَفْسِهِ The second segment is segment number 56, which is to cure pain, where it says, for whom are noblest example? for whom are high attributes, who is the master of the beginning and the end, who is the master of the abode of paradise, for whom are great signs, for whom is order and judgment, who rules over the atmosphere and expanses, whose is the lordship of the highest heaven and the earth. Now, the Terminology is that we're going to focus on is Al Asma Al Husna that we have talked about it. One word of the Prophet, peace be upon him, he says that, Inna lillahi tis'an wa tis'una isman. 99 names 
are for the Almighty that are called Al Asma Al Husna, the beautiful attributes. Man Ahsaha Dakhal Al Jannah. Whoever learns them will get into paradise. Then segment number 57, which is to prevent misfortune. The theme is to prevent misfortune, where it says, O oh, the pardoner, the forgiver, the patient, the greatest, the greatest appreciator, kind, sympathetic, besought, friend, most glorified, most holy. The word Ya Ghafuru, Ya Afuwu, Ya Ghafuru, Ya Sabur, the most patient, the most one with forbearance. God teach us to be patient. God wants his prophet, his messengers to be patient. The reason is that you will accomplish things with patience. If you do not have patience or enough patience, things cannot be accomplished. You cannot see the end result. You study for nine months diligently with so much emphasis on the subject in order to pass after the nine months. This patient's nine months are required in order to, for you to be successful. The Almighty Allah always emphasizes on being patient. Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, has a beautiful words about patience. He says, الصبر في الأمور بمنزلة الرأس من الجسد فإذا فارق الرأس الجسد فسد الجسد وإذا فارق الصبر الأمور فسدت الأمور The patience and forbearance to the affairs, to things that we conduct to our daily activities and daily affairs is similar to the head compared to the body. The body are the affairs and their head is patience, meaning it's an integral part of any deal, of any affair, of any activity is patience. In the same manner, when the body loses the head, it spoils and become rotten and dead. The same thing, the affairs will be rotten. They get spoiled if they lose the, the patient. Therefore, the patience is an integral part of any process. With patience, you will receive the reward in this life and in the hereafter. The Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has this beautiful eloquent words in the Holy Quran. It says, Inna yuwaffa hisab. They will get ample in return without any accounts. Multiples of rewards that has no limit due to the patience. That much patience can bring us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consider us among his patient servants in this holy month. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In the past, I had a brother in faith, and he was prestigious in my view because the world was humble in his eyes. The needs of the stomach did not have sway over him. He did not long for what he did not get. If he got a thing, he would not ask for more. Most of his time, he was silent. If he spoke, he silenced the other speakers. He quenched the thirst of questioners. He was weak and feeble, but at the time of fighting, he was like the loin of the forest or the serpent of the valley. He would not put forth an argument unless it was decisive. He would not abuse anyone in an excusable matter unless he had heard the excuse. He would not speak of any trouble except after his, its disappearance. He would say what he would do and would not say what he would not do. Even if he could be exceeded in speaking, he could not be excelled in silence. He was more eager for keeping quiet than speaking. And if two things confronted him, he would see which one was more akin to the longing of heart and would oppose it. These qualities are incumbent upon you, so you should acquire them and excel each other in them. Even if you cannot acquire them, you should know that acquiring a part is better than giving up the whole.